October the 6th, 2001. My name is Charla Henson. We're at the 12th Armored Museum, and I'm speaking to Frank Conway. Tell me your full name and where you were born <clears throat> and the date of your birth. I was born April 7th, 1922, Hard County, Indiana. Okay. Tell me how you got into the Army. I was drafted in 1943. Where, where was this at? At Kokomo, Indiana. Okay. No, Indianapolis, Indiana. Indianapolis, Indiana is where we drafted. Okay. Tell me about your first, the first memories you have of basic training. Getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning and doing calisthenics. That's one thing. Who is one of the, is there a man that you remember uh, during your basic training that stands out in your mind? A man? A uh -huh, man? I couldn't tell you. I don't recall. Okay. So 50, was it... 54 years ago, it would be hard to remember. <laughs> okay. Well, was your basic training what you expected it to be? I guess so, yes. It was as rough as I thought it would be. Okay. How, tell me how you got to Camp Barkley. We went by train from Fort Knox to Camp Barkley by train. Now what was your what was your training at, at Knox? Was that tank training or more less a general mm -hmm. training. A little of everything. Although we realized it was an armored camp and uh, we had uh, rifle range as a little a small degree and just a little of everything. And uh, of course, then it's transferred to Camp Camel and is uh, assigned a tank. And uh, that's what I was working in uh, when the war was over, a tank. Were, did the tanks that you trained in, were they the same tr tr kind of tr tanks that you used in Europe? Yes, they were medium tanks, although that was the largest tank that was ever used. Uh, but they called them medium tanks. But they. At the, why they did that, later on they experimented and and they made a bigger tank, but it was so clumsy that they couldn't use it, so they dropped production of it. <clears throat> Draw me a picture with words of your tank, what it was like on the outside, where you sat, what it was like on the inside. Well, uh, I had a small seat. And uh, I had this periscope in front of me, and I had the big gun controls there, and I would wait orders from the tank commander to tell me to pick out a target and, of course, fire the gun. And to my left was the assistant gunner, and his job was to pull the uh, shell out from underneath the floor in the tank, which had a lid on it, and he would shove it in the tank or into the uh, gun. And uh, as soon as I'd fire one, well, he'd put another one in it. And it, it, it wasn't anything uh, automatic about it. I mean, you just had to put that shell in itself. You did not like a automatic pistol or something like that. Just keep going on. What was the distance between, there were, were there four or five of you in the tank? There were five. Five. Can you tell me kind of the distance, kind of the where they were around you? Well, like I say, I was as a gunner sitting on the right hand side of the tank, and the assistant gunner over here on the left side, and above or be, uh, behind me was the tank commander, and in front of me was the assistant gunner down lower, and the driver here was on the left side lower, and uh, it was almost impossible to give. Uh, directions to the driver uh, unless you had the earphones the, the earphones do it and the company or the uh, tank commander had the control of that he could talk to me or he could talk to the or he could talk to all of us either way if I remember correctly could you touch him by reaching back or or putting your foot or, or were, was the distance far enough that you well, it was very crowded, 
you didn't have much <laughs> room in them. And like I say, the assistant gunner sat right here, and I sat here. Then you had the gun between us, the gun uh, body in between us, so there wasn't much room. That that was it. <laughs> about. When you were at Barclay, uh, can you take us through some of your field experiences? Well, we'd uh, we'd go out with our tanks and uh, practice firing, and uh, occasionally we would have the experience of a track over the track breaking, and then we'd have to call the maintenance in to put that track on or repair it or we couldn't run it anymore. And occasionally that would happen. Maybe you would put too much strain on one way or the other, you know, and it it would break the track. And of course we went out and stayed uh, different times, stayed all night. We'd pitch a tent. Uh, it was a lot different when you got in combat. You didn't pitch any tents, <laughs> that's for sure. So was your tank kind of your home? Is that where you, did oh, you yeah. sleep in there or? Uh, well, I'd say of a night when the uh, combat was in uh, action that we would sleep out of the tank because the Germans had Panzer, Panzerfaust, they call it, and they could get within 30, 40 feet and they could shoot that, and that would hit that tank in the turret, for instance, and the steel would just fly every place. And we lost uh, many tank people from that. So we'd stay on the back. Uh, that would keep us from getting the effects of that in the interior of the tank. And and we also, we also uh, we'd park our tanks in a more or less a circle, and then we'd have guards around on the outside while some slept while we were guarded to protect ourselves. Uh, but I've slept many a night on the back of the tank. And when it's cold weather, it's a nice place to sleep because you had some, some heat from that hot engine. You wouldn't leave it run, you wouldn't leave it run and lay, uh, lay up on it, but it would be real hot when you'd shut off and it'd stay warm for quite a while. That steel would stay warm for quite a while. Is there a, um, anybody that stands out in your mind uh, in your training at Camp Barkley, either a, a somebody that was in your company or a captain or a sergeant? Well, George uh, Homo was my tank commander at the time. And uh, of course, a member supply sergeant. and. Of course, you, go, you grow uh, close to different people by being around them a lot like that. Uh, I'd say probably uh, the tank commander because he was your closest commander. It was probably the, you know, maybe the remembered the most, I imagine. Was there a, a camaraderie between y'all or was it pretty much he was the, he was the captain and y'all were the <coughs> privates? Well, uh, I was fortunate. Uh, when I went overseas, uh, there was a really he was really a good uh, tank commander. In fact, he 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 was uh, had an, he was hit, hit by a sniper, and you can see his name out there on 23rd Tank Battalion on some favors, certainly on three or four of them there. But he was a uh, he's a big husky fella, and he's a football player, and. Uh, I got well acquainted with him because I, he stood behind me a lot, see. And his birthday was April 6th, 1922, and mine was April the 7th, 1922. So we were called twins all the time <laughs> by the other part of the tank crew. But yes, you, you grow to uh, really get close to them. The fact of it is uh, my tank commander, uh, I mean my... Uh, driver I had was, uh, well, his wife's and daughter's out there today, Bob and, or Norman, you know, Mar Norman, Norma and Marcia Grover. 
Well, Norma's husband was my tank commander, or not my driver. And, uh, and so we visited back and forth uh, quite a bit after the war, and, and we still visit today. Of course, uh, Bob is gone. He died here a few years back. Who was the, what was the name of your tank commander? Well, that was uh, Vickless. And then he, uh, it was standard procedure, if something ever happened to the tank commander, the gunner would be next in command. So after uh, uh, Vic was killed, well, I, had, I had assumed the job as tank commander then. And then I had a, the assistant gunner was to go for the gunner, and then they put another in. That was the standard procedure. When y'all, um, when it came time to shoot, was the tank commander in radio contact with someone out there? Or well, he was getting you know? there. He, yes, he was con uh, with uh, contact of the uh, battalion commander. Uh, well, first the company commander, and then the company commander, the battalion commander, and it was chain of command, actually. When he, when he gave you uh, orders to shoot, uh, did you have to calculate height, directions? For, how I'd, did that happen from the time he gave you orders until you shot? What all did you do? He would tell me that there's a tank so many degrees right or left or maybe right in front and I'd have to get the tank uh, gun around out of way and I had a periscope I'd look through and I'd pick out this target and uh, if I had it right in my sights well then I'd fire the gun. So you learned how the the altitude and horizontal yes. and... Yeah, you, you had that. In other words, the farther away the more altitude you had to give it. How did you learn that? How did well, you learn that, about that? Well, that was a training. That's what training you had. A gunner was trained to do that. Was, uh, was that a special job, or was they just chose, you're going to be a gunner and training how to no, do that? No, no. You, if you were chosen to be a gunner, it was a gunner training. It, not everybody, I'd say, was qualified to sit in that seat and fire that gun. Not that it was that hard, but you had to have training to do it. To understand, like you mentioned, uh, figuring the, uh, how much degrees right, how much left, and up and down, and so forth. Did the, the tra tra what's that, the gun, how, where it shoots, did that vary with tanks? Did you have to learn how to shoot by how well, to tank? You mean while we're moving? Well, yeah, but that made it more difficult to hit your target when you're moving. You'd much rather be stopped to get an accurate shot. But uh, some uh, areas there in, the, in uh, France and Germany was fairly flat ground. And uh, you would try to stop before you shot, although you could on a flat area. A little bit, a little more accurate if he was on a windy road or something like that. Uh, just a side note, our tanks weren't very safe as the German tanks from the front. Uh, the German tank had a thicker steel front than what the American tank had. So, uh, we would try to avoid letting them get a good shot at us. We'd try to, you know, move or something. That's, and same way with them, we would try to wait until they were running in front of us instead of coming towards us. Some way we'd get around where they'd be going in front of us. And then we could puncture their tank. It'd, it'd but easier. not head on. But not, not, we weren't successful head on. mobility of the tank, of your lightweight tank, uh, space it took to turn around, easiness, all that? Well, I don't know how many, it would, uh, I don't know how to hardly tell you how many feet it is, but I'd say it would take a, uh, probably a quarter of a block, city block, to get it turned around, unless you skidded around, then that'd be easier. Uh, it wasn't uh, 
it wasn't very a uh, uh, movable object. I mean, you could, it, it was hard to kind of get get around in places. I uh, I had training also on the driver of the tank, but I still at the same time I was just supposed to be a gunner. But we did get a little training on to drive the tank. It was that was an interesting job. I mean, driving at least you could see out. You know, of course, it was occasionally you had to put your hatch down, but you had periscope you could see out. But as a gunner, you sat in there, and the only thing you could see was through that periscope, and you'd have to, it would turn with the tank, because the turret would turn, but he could see things. Well, he, a lot of times, he would drive with his head out of the tank. He didn't have it covered, see. And, but I couldn't do that as a gunner. I had to look out that periscope, or I didn't see anything. And that was looking for a target. And even even when we were driving, uh, say we were just moving, we knew the, the enemy was quite a ways ahead. I was still in that gunner seat and couldn't see much. I did kind of a isolated place, I'd say. Tell me about um, uh, you got on trains, you went to New York. Uh, you sailed across the Atlantic. Tell me about what it was like for you as you knew the time was headed for, to go to, um, from England over to France. Well, I'd say it was a very uh, exciting time. I'm sure we knew probably it was going to come sooner or later. And uh, we didn't have a rough at all. But, uh, was what the men did on D-Day, because uh, we went across and took our tanks off the LST and, and took off. There wasn't any shooting or like that, but of course those boys that went in there on D-Day, that was terrible, terrible. Sometimes wonder why they had to do it that way, but... How did you get, uh, how did you get your tank? How, how, what was the process of getting your tank? Did you get it in England? Did you get it in France? What? How did? How did you get your t equipment? We left the tanks we trained in here. We never used them. We went across on this boat, and uh, we were issued tanks then in England. And they knew they had cosmoto uh, cos cosmoline. I should get it right. All over them and. Boy, that was a job to get off. What was Cosmoline? Well, that was a coating they put on to protect the metal. Oh, that was terrible. So we was there about 30 days, I suppose, or, and working on those tanks, and then we put the tanks on the LST and and went across the channel in. How did you get this Cosmoline? You said you had to get it off the tanks? <laughs> yes, we had to get it off. Uh, well, you scrape on it, and... Gasoline might have been a help too, and uh, mostly scrape. I mean, it was it was a job, the job. When you when you when you and your uh, tank commander and the driver and everybody got into a tank, did it kind of become like home for you? And did you name it, or, or was it sort of a? Well, we were together all the time. You know, in a tank, you get used to them and. And I suppose it's natural. Some uh, some of the tank members maybe uh, they you know maybe get sick or maybe they get injured, and then they would be a replacement come in, and so you had to get acquainted with him. And it it was a place where there's quite a bit of changeover because occasionally you'd lose men or they'd get sick or you know and but it was uh, you got so you. He appreciated each other for what we were doing. I was glad that the driver knew what he was doing. As this law, I was glad that the assistant gunner knew what he was doing to give, put that shell in that gun. And you, you grow as a family, really. And of course, we ate together. You might say all, all the time, whether it's in the tank or it's outside of the tank. But there's a closeness you get to the. Men that you're working with. Tell me 
the first day of battle? When was the first day when for us? When was the first day of battle, and what do you remember about it? Well, our first battle was Hurleysheim, and uh, that was in the latter part of December, if I remember correctly. And uh, it was a real, a real experience because we had a lot of competition right then. I mean, it was uh, would give us a good breaking in, and then uh, probably is the roughest battle we had. I'd say right the first one, and. Our company, I mean, our battalion commander lost his life too then. But that was inside of France quite a ways then. And uh, you wonder, you wonder at times, you know, a long, young fellow like that, he was a real young lieutenant colonel, and uh, the sniper got him. And what was his name? Megs, M-E-I-G-S. But he was just a young fellow. He was... Uh, I don't suppose he was 25 yet. He was a, he'd made colonel, lieutenant colonel. He's very. Uh, he was very in, uh, army. Well, I'd say experienced. His uh, his father was a army officer, and his grandfather was an army officer, and he's raised up an army officer, and his son is a four-star general in Europe, and um, they was hoping they could get him here to talk uh, to the, the, the reunion here, but he was couldn't make it. But he has been to the reunion two or three times, I think. But he made, he made four-star general just recently. Tell me about... Uh, he was just, he, well, I might add, he was just, uh, let's see, the, 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 the colonel that was our battalion commander, uh, just had this son a short time before we left the States. And that's the son, now it's the lieutenant general, or the four-star general. So he never knew his dad. He never knew his dad. And he was in the 23rd. He was, he, he was company, com or battalion commander the 23rd. Okay. Yeah. okay. Colonel Meigs. Tell me about Vickless, what happened to him, uh, as the war went on, if you don't mind. Well, it was just like this wall right here, and we were under a tank along here, and there was a sniper up there on top of that hill, and unaware that there was a, somebody up there, and Vickless was standing out of the turret, hit out of the turret, and uh, Oh, once a shot hit the tank cover, and he knew that, and Vic knew that, and you see right into the ball bearings where it turned, and the, the real light uh, slivers from that metal, just like you see it flying around for just an instant. And I know Vic excited and didn't think, but he stuck his head out again, and the sniper got him that time. And so after that happened, well, like I mentioned earlier, that it was standard procedure that uh, uh, Gunner take over as tank commander. So I uh, give orders to the driver to back the tank out, and, or back it up, rather, and uh, we were able to get him out. And the medic was right there, and of course it was too late, but they took the body anyway. what it was like to be a tank commander? Well, you had responsibility. You had, you know, you were in charge of that tank. You were in charge of the driver and the gunner and the assistant gunner and and uh, it was hard to, you know, like anything that you're ahead of, it's hard, it's hard not to make a mistake. And a lot of times, uh, maybe they direct the gunner to the wrong way or something like that, which is human. But uh, generally, they were trained to. They generally, they was trained pretty well to be able to carry on. But I'd have to say this: uh, Vickless was a was a very uh, accurate man, if anybody could be. He was. He knew what was going on. 
I might mention uh, now this was in March when he was when he was killed and of course the war was over in May and uh, so I wouldn't thank him under too awfully long that time but uh, oh he had also earned a battlefield commission after the Hurlesheim ordeal shortly after that they were needing officers and and he volunteered to be a second lieutenant so when he died he was a second lieutenant and he was then a, 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 would be a company commander tell me about the field com commission the, what was that about and what did it mean well heard they, mention if that. they needed maybe they needed officers and uh, they'd ask uh, anybody that was soldiers interested, they'd like to, you know, they had to be probably sergeants or buck sergeants, master sergeants, they'd like to be a, an officer. And uh, and they would, if they did, why, and they, the board felt that he was capable of handling the job, why, they'd, they'd give him a battlefield commission. A lot, uh, a lot of fellows, and myself included, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want a battlefield commission. I mean, I wouldn't be interested in that. But there's a lot of them that didn't mind that. They'd be Did glad you get to get more it. money, or oh yeah, you get more money, mm -hmm. more responsibility. Be you responsible for for more men. What you'd be responsible for more of the men. Oh yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let's go back to Herlesheim. And can you tell me uh, where you were in your tank and your experiences going through Hurlesheim? Well, I, of course, was a gunner. And uh, luckily we were able to be successful in knocking the tanks out. And uh, by being more or less the first battle of any, any amount, no, I, I'd have to say it's scary, <laughs> frightening. <laughs> how do you deal with fear? How how did you men deal with the fear? Did you talk about it or? You went into it before you realized it. You know, you just you knew you had a job to do, and you just do it, and then get scared afterwards a lot of times. Did all of you? Did all five of you get through Hurlesheim? Okay. Did yes. all the guys in your tank? Yes, we did. We did. The fact of it is that we were all very fortunate, other than uh, Vickless, uh, we never got a scratch. That's real unusual for a tank. It sure tank. is. Yeah. It sure is. What was the closest call you ever had? Of getting hit or, or being, you thought this was really well. You don't know. You really don't know how many times that you're fired upon, other than you can. If, if a big shell hits you, you would really tell it. It'd rock the tank. But of course, if if it was infantry, infantry you were fighting, and they had thirty caliber machine guns, well, that wouldn't bother you. But you could tell when he'd hit the tank, but it it wouldn't pierce the armor. And uh, I don't know. I, I know uh, the infantrymen occasionally would ride on the back of the tank where we were working with the infantry, and those infantrymen didn't like that. They, they felt like they was uh, being exposed too much, and, uh, and they'd, want, they'd said they'd rather be on the ground. Of course, we, we would tell them we'd rather be in that tank as be on the ground, so we we always had kind of a little competition there with each other. Did you ever feel like you were in a can? Just oh yeah, a can. yeah, yeah, yeah. You felt like you was crowded, you know. I will tell you, it was once in a great while. For some reason, we might put a five-gallon or ten-gallon can in there with water or something we might need. And you'd have to scrape around there to find a place to put it. It, it was really crowded. <laughs> How much ammunition could you carry? 
if you if you were full. Ammunition. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't I can't remember, but I'd uh, I'd say we could carry forty rounds of that for the big gun. I'm just guessing now, but I can't remember how many it was, but I'd say at least 40. And then you had your bed rolls and all your personal things inside there also? We couldn't, didn't have room for them in there, but we had, on the back of our tanks, we had a, uh, a box-like affair, crate or whatever you want to call it, and we put our bag rolls and all that stuff in there, bed rolls, and we carried it in there. Couldn't carry it down inside at all. Of course, we didn't have that problem so much in the States, but when you get overseas, they're a little different. You had to have a place you could put them. Tell me about, uh, there's a story that's been going around about uh, Glover and driving a tank. And Was there a weird story about y'all running over somebody? or Did y'all run over Brad Dressler? Mr. Glover? Mr. Glover? Mr. Who? Uh, Marsh's daddy, Grover. 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 Is it, they tell a story about an accident he had or something with y'all's tank. Do you remember anything about that? About backing up on Brad Dressler's medic truck? Do you remember that? Can you tell me about it? That was right after Vickless died. Oh, was it? And I was telling driver to, or to Grover to back up. And we backed over the medic mm -hmm. jeep. That's when that happened. That's when it happened. Mm -hmm. I was excited too. Mm -hmm. And of course, I couldn't see it back there. See, mm -hmm. and uh, and I wasn't about to stick my head out the current after that. <laughs> Vic got shot, but we did. We backed up over the medic jeep. I, I, of course, I didn't see it, but they said he had two uh, injured on his Jeep, <laughs> and they got off. <laughs> but uh, we we don't talk about it much, really. See, Brad Dressler was a medic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard him laughing about Brad getting run over by a tank. I didn't know in what situation that was. Um, I, I, my thoughts was to back up to get away from this place. And uh, I was instructing to back up, but I... I couldn't see the jeep. I didn't know he, he was right. Why well, he was doing right up behind me? I don't know. Behind the tank. But it wasn't anybody hurt or anything like that. Might have run that jeep, but. <laughs> and those guys moved real fast. Okay. Yeah. What did you learn about yourself during the war? <laughs> well, I learned that I could be scared pretty easy. Excited. And uh, a lot of things you do that you c didn't think you could do, you know, in a situation like come about. Uh, I've often said I wouldn't take anything from experiences, but I wouldn't want to do it again. But talking about uh, companionship, you learn that. Uh, it's, it's great. and uh, So many of uh, the one was Barclay, why I was married and his uh, wife was able to come down and stay. We was here nine months and she came down and stayed. And uh, Eber Hartley's wife came down and of course he was her supply sergeant. And uh, Bob Grover married Marcia while they lived here in Abilene. While she lived here in Abilene, they got married here. And then uh, Harry Wall was another one that his wife, well, my wife and his wife uh, stayed together in a rent a couple bedrooms off an old older fellow who was a retired minister. And uh, we'd come up there on weekends, once in a while through the week, but generally we'd get off on the weekends while we were here in Camp Barclay. 
and we'd have big time, all of us get together. <laughs> that kind of helped a little. When you uh, when you think of uh, of the guys, what was a real riotous time? Was there ever a funny time? Ever anything that oh, kept yeah. you going? Oh Tell yeah. Oh yeah. Some of those stories. <laughs> well, we were in Germany one time, and. Uh, maybe did I? I might have told you that the other night. Maybe not. But anyway. Tell me again. It's not on here. <laughs> we was in this little village in Germany, and and it was evening, and it was one of these house and barns together. In other words, the the livestock stayed in the house or the barn or either way. It was one building. But anyway, we was built it in part of it. And, of course, it was dark, you didn't, what light you had was very little, you know, the electricity was going, and anyway, we had eggs available, and we had potatoes available, so we thought it'd be a good thing, we'd just peel some potatoes, we'd have fried potatoes, and we'd beat the eggs up, and we'd have eggs over the potatoes. So, uh, we finally found in their kitchen, a room they had for a kitchen, I guess you called that, but we needed lard, you know, to sew the fry it. And luckily we found some. One of the boys did. So we was in good shape. You know, we had eggs and potatoes. And really it tasted all right. The next morning, uh, it was daylight, and we looked, and that lard had flies in it. <laughs> so we, but we hadn't tasted the flies, but I, I know they were in there. <laughs> we had, we all, we had a lot of little things, you know, to laugh about. And we got a big kick out of that. <laughs> we, uh, I know we were a little more careful from then on. <laughs> After Hurlsheim, tell me about getting over to Colmar, the Colmar Pocket. And and y'all were um, y'all y'all were given a kind of a rest. You went back behind the lines after Hurlsheim just to get replacements and stuff. Yeah, and we went we went back for a few days, but really. I don't remember any, right now, any special events that took place other than just going towards the Colmar, uh, they call it Colmar Pocket, that we... Did helped. you uh, face much resistance or was it pretty fast going? Uh, well, it was bad enough, but nothing like Hurley Shine, mm -hmm. uh, to my, my opinion. you got to Colmar, did y'all, did the 23rd, did your company go into the city or were y'all kind of around about it? Well, you know, I can't answer that. I don't know. I really don't know. There again, I was inside that tank and I couldn't see anything, only the something I was supposed to shoot at. <laughs> now, you were, um, you were a uh, tank commander in Colmar, weren't you? Were you tank commander by Colmar? No, I wasn't made tank commander until Vickless died, oh. and that was March the 20th, March. Mm -hmm. March 30th, I believe it is. Was that weird, having a kid, I mean, you had been watching through this little hole now, and then you had to get up and put the turret up and stand up, and how, how was that different for you? Well, that particular time, I was, I was very cautious about putting my head out the top. And this was really uninspected. We were just in a column, and and uh, the first shot the fellow missed. And the second shot he he got Vickless. That's it. All there was to it. So when that happened, why we we couldn't get him out of the tank. So that's when I took over. We was backing up to get away from this, and uh, and we got back far enough that uh, the gunner and I. Their assistant gunner and I lifted him out of the 
tank, and then there was fellows on top of the tank to take the body out. And then you just kept on going? Yeah. Y'all just got back in your tank and uh, yeah. kept moving? But, but uh, our tank at the time was on the point. We were the leading tank. So after Vickless was hit, why, and I took over command of the tank, they put my, t my tank at the end of the column so I didn't have to be in the point anymore. But we was in the point quite a while especially in Hurlesheim and those. In other words, uh, if he's going to shoot anybody, they'd shoot to one lead, you know. But we were fortunate. We, we got it out without any scratches. All but big, of course. That is, that is a... Do you, ever, do you ever think about what got you through the war? What? What things got you through the war, either your your own personal characteristics or camaraderie? Oh, I, I never I never thought about what I'd make at home. I never, I always felt like that's a way to feel because you think you're not going to make it, you might not make it. But I always had a positive thought to get home. I know one particular guy that we, going over to Germany, or to England, he, he felt sure that he'd never make it back, and he was killed. You know, he not anything that he particularly done or anything, but he, he lost his life. And when you uh, when you look back. Um, was there anything that your parents kind of instilled in you that helped you get through the war? Well, of course, none of my family is ever in a service to know to help, you know, to you know, tell you what you could be going through or anything, I guess. I get a little emotional. It was a pretty emotional time, wasn't it? Yeah. I'd have to say I had a praying mother. I know she was praying every day. When y'all got through Comar, where do you remember where y'all went or uh, as, as the war was coming to an end, uh, where you were when you found out the news that the war was going to be over? Yeah. We were about to enter Austria and uh, the war was over, actually, and uh, we were going down a road, and all at once it come, it was blocked. And up here on the side was uh, some soldiers that didn't know the war was over, and they were shooting Panzerfaust, which that's something we dreaded. See, so luckily we got back out of that, backed out of that, that we couldn't get through. It was on winding road and and a fog. We, we had to back out, but those fellows never been contacted, no doubt, that the war had ended. So they were still trying to <laughs> get somebody, but uh, luckily we didn't have any problem. We were able to back down, and the tanks behind us got to back down. And you had to be pretty careful at the end, didn't you? Well, yeah, the, yeah. Not a, the German soldiers were so... Uh, I reckon you say ill-managed at the at the end of the war. They were spotted here and they were spotted there, and and they hadn't got the word out. A lot of them, I'm sure, that the war was over. But they were glad. They were all wanting to quit. That's for sure. 
And, is that why they all came walking down the roads and to surrender? I mean, did oh, they yeah. know it was oh, over, or was it just... Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was easy. It was easy to take them after the war was over. They was they didn't want to be shot or anything like that. They was glad to give up. Mm -hmm. Did any of your tanks go? Did y'all um, go by any of the death camps or the concentration camps? We had we had some we had some uh, soldiers that were captured and were in concentration camp. But uh, not from our company. We never had lost any title of from our company. But from the Twelfth Armored Division, there's some was lost. Or they put concentration camps. But y'all didn't y'all didn't see any as y'all were going through Germany. You didn't free any of them. The twenty third, did you? No, we didn't. Not to my knowledge. But there was some from the other uh, outfits in the Twelfth that did. Tell me how you got to the end of the war. How what? How, how you it got ended the war and where you went after the war was over. Well, I guess uh, I was home three weeks. I was discharged on April first, forty six, and three weeks later I went to work. I had a job offer, two job offers, and they both were the same salary. One was working in a Ford dealership, and the other one was working uh, driving an oil truck. They both offered the same salary. I'd worked for both of them prior for a short time, and it was hard for me to decide. And I didn't, I told both of the bosses of each one, I said, I'll be to work Monday morning at the place I wanted to go to work. And you know, I didn't know Monday morning whether I was going to go to work. I couldn't make up my mind because I liked both places. And uh, I, I, Monday I went to work for the Ford dealership. <laughs> I worked there 40 years. <laughs> Ended up being the owner. <laughs> I started out as a general flunky, you might say. And then I got to be general manager and then the boss he wanted to sell out and I bought him out. I owned it in 14 years and I retired in 86. 46 to 86, 40 years. I always ask this question before we, we, we quit. Um, there are going to be people who see this tape, maybe your children or uh, young children, who young people who come through and look at this. What would you tell the next generation or two or three generations from now about what you learned and what you would hope for them from your experience? Well, World I'd, War II? you know, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. And I just hope that we'd never have to. Uh, you know, they'd, they wouldn't have to go to war. That's a terrible thing. And uh, I think they ought to appreciate what they've got, the life they've got. And I just hope now that this conflict we're in, they're about to get into, uh, will be settled before any more shed blood. I really do. I, uh, I. I just can't feel that we should go over there and start tearing Afghanistan up. I just can't feel it like, because there's a lot of innocent people there. And if we do, I feel like we're not much better than the ones that <laughs> tore up our buildings in Washington and New York and killed those people. Surely we can get something settled, I'd think, without a lot of bloodshed. That's my feeling on it. I'm not. What has the 12th Armored Division done for you? I mean, has it has it helped you in dealing with memories or? You mean to have the fellowships like? Oh, it's mm -hmm. it's been an enjoyable thing. I haven't attended near all the reunions, but uh, the ones I have attended, I've enjoyed it and. And uh, 
of course, there's a lot of re uh, hatch stories that come about, you know. <laughs> but uh, it, it's a closeness that you have that you can continue making, uh, getting to see people that you've worked with. And Tell me a story that you've told your kids through the years. Tell me a story that you haven't told me that you, you've told your family that you wouldn't mind having on tape. Any stories you, know, you hadn't told? You know, I haven't told them much. Have you not? They, they haven't inquired, and I haven't uh, told them much. I can't recall anything that... Oh, we, they might ask a question, but they never bothered too much. They probably learn more from probably learn more from uh, the kids visiting with the kids of Grovers and the Walls and <laughs> some of those talking back and forth. I'd say that probably what we've told them. That's well. Have I missed something? Have I missed something? Is there anything you think that I haven't covered that I that I forgot to cover, or, or you know that I don't know then I don't know to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've done a very good job. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate so much that we got to get this in. We've been trying for three years to get. I, you I didn't know. Out. I didn't know about it till oh, Marcia told me. Yeah. Marcia's been after me for three years to get you, but I appreciate you coming so much. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Oh, you're welcome.